ladies and gentlemen, your next speaker is one of the top swimmers in the world. He's number one in the nation, and he's on a mission to help a million people learn how to swim. Uh, I'm here to introduce Mr. Jamal Hill to you. I hope you sit back and you enjoy this conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, what's going on today? We have a very special interview for you. Uh, we are interviewing Mr. Jamal Hill. Jamal, thanks for joining. I don't like to do intros. I like you to introduce yourself. So if you could tell the people who is Jamal Hill. 100%. I am a Los Angeles-based educator and Team USA Paralympic swimmer. That's, that's it right there. <laughs> educator and Paralympic swimmer. Yes, sir. And so why is education so important to you? Oh, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, so education is so important to me really just because uh you know the way i came up so my uncles and aunts they were all like uh quite literally rocket scientists doctors chiropractors um you know orthopedic surgeons um engineers so i just came up really in a strong culture of higher education um and for a long time i wanted to be a doctor a medical doctor western medicine doctor um, and, you know, just kind of the more that I got into self-education, um, the less I kind of wanted to go that traditional route of, you know, what, what, uh, I guess what, like the monopolies of higher education can give you in terms of career, um, and really just started to kind of build curriculums that I thought, you know, serviced me and what my interests were. And, you know, a lot of my interests are community building, um, obviously swimming, um, disability awareness, um, you know, you know, uh, restructuring and re-educating uh, my black community. Um, so, you know, I just think, I think education is amazing because of applied knowledge is power. So that is, I take great pride in being an educator, probably one of the most noble jobs there is in the world, in my humble opinion. <laughs> applied knowledge is power. I, yes, I love sir. that. Um, so, this whole summit is like uh, the whole thing is peel back the label of disability. So when you think about that phrase and mm -hmm. peeling back the label of disability, what does that look like from your perspective? Powerful. Um, from my perspective, <clears throat> also you gotta understand like uh, pretty much my perspective is um, the stigma of disability. You know, that it's something that anyone should just be able to see and easily acknowledge um, and then therefore typecast that individual. So, you know, especially me, like dealing with Charcot Marie Tooth um, and being an elite athlete, you know, for most of my life, you know, and again, had I never really talked about it, people would not know the disabilities that I was dealing with. Um, they would not know the neuropathies because it's not just visible to the naked eye. So that, that is a, you know, very short, short breath. Uh, exactly what I think, like really kind of exiting out of this stigma of like, oh, you know, you're, you're only disabled if you're missing a limb or um, if, you know, or if people can just see it. Like if someone feels like they can see it, that makes it real. And that's not what makes it real. Yeah. You're, and, and people probably say, you're six foot four. <laughs> you you represent the United States. Uh, yeah. So what are you talking about disability for? <laughs> uh, literally a hundred percent. Everyone is always, you know, so shocked and surprised for a long time. Um, you know, just being straight up, my disability was a big point of shame, a big point of contention, and you know, fortunately, um, and I think. A lot of us, like everyone pretty much I speak to experiences this, but you know, again, a slightly privileged position, mine was not something that the outside world automatically had to know about, you know? Mm -hmm. um, again, I was able to keep it under wraps. I was able to keep it a secret. But um, yeah, for like 12 years, 
really like the middle of my life from ages 10 to 22 for 12 years. Um, you know, something I never talked about, something I never addressed, always had an excuse or a reason as to why something wasn't quite working, opposed to just coming out with that truth. Uh, so yeah, I still, you know, fortunately, I think the one thing about, um, I, one thing about disability, I think that like, the mass public is, you know, very, uh, I think a good thing is like, people are not as quick to call you a liar, right? Like, no one has ever just called me a liar. <laughs> Whether they were thinking or not, I don't know, but no one has ever called me a liar or truly challenged or truly challenged me or anyone else that I've met um, on the circumstances that they've been born with or have adopted um, or, you know, have gone through. But that is definitely something that, you know, people are shocked to find out like, oh my God, dude, like you look like you're in better shape than I am. You for sure can do these things that I definitely cannot do. Um, so are you sure that you have this? <laughs> <laughs> do you have it? <laughs> and you're like yes I'm, i am in way way better shape than you <laughs> yeah that's exactly what i say like, yes you know sir, sir ma'am believe it or not it is quite literally my job to be in better shape than you so <laughs> yeah yeah a hundred percent so i i'd be interested um just from doing the summit i've i've learned a little bit more about your particular disability but if you could walk somebody through like what are some of the things you experience on a regular basis uh, because this is something you deal with that'd be great absolutely um so at the age of 10 years old i was diagnosed with charco marie tooth charco marie tooth um so it's three names of three fish scientists who essentially discovered this disease um, what this disease is, is a type of degenerative muscular neuropathy. Uh, so essentially like, right, it gets worse over time. That's what that means. And uh, like, honestly, like a lot of muscular uh, neuropathies, there's so many different categories, um, so many different variations of the disease. I can't even begin to tell you. Uh, but specifically what I have is something called CMT1X. Um, it's carried by the X chromosome in families. It is congenital, so you know it's something that I inherited from my mother, and it just happened to the the cells just happened to turn on when I was ten years old, or the mutation I guess happened to uh, be ignited when I was ten years old. And so at ten years old, how that manifested for me was initially I was in a state of paralysis. Um, so at its worst, you know, when I have what you know most people could construe as a flare up, when I have a flare up. Um, I can go into a state of paralysis. So, you know, worst case scenario would be full body paralysis temporarily, um, which happened when I was 10 and I had to be hospitalized for a few weeks at Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. Um, middle case scenario would just be like, you know, kind of when, uh, you know, when you sit too long, everyone, everyone knows this, when you sit too long and your limbs go to sleep. Um, so that would be middle case scenario that I'm just dealing with like some type of partial paralysis um but every day day-to-day -day life for me pretty much so like the nerve conductivity from my elbow to my fingertips is only 30 percent out of a hundred percent which would be you know just a regular human being so what that looks like is i have trouble with uh tactile tactile uh, things so like holding things i'm the guy that always drops his phone on his face when he's laying down i drop glasses of water um you know <laughs> things like that and then my peripheral nerves in my lower leg, so everything from my knee to the soles of my feet, I actually have 0% nerve conductivity. Um, so how I explain that to people is, uh, pretty much it's like I'm walking on my knees. So like my legs are there, but it's really like I'm walking on my knees. Like if you kick me in my shins, I'll feel it. Um, you know, if I step on a piece of glass and cut my fit, I will, you know, scream and curse. Um, but in terms of, you know, inside out motor control so things like wiggling my toes things like you know building stronger calves or you know improving my ankle strength or improving my wrist strength uh those are i don't want to say impossible but those are extremely 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 challenging for me um yeah and so that's kind of what that means and if i may just a little bit thing nerve conductivity another thing that kind of helps people understand that is <clears throat> pretty much like if someone were to shock you with an electro probe 
something like that. Like that's how they usually test nerve conductivity. I know it seems a little bit medieval, but that is that is still the practice. Um, so that would shock you with an electro probe. So again, like if someone were to shock me in my chest, my entire body would spaz and jump, and you know I, I can react. But if I'm shocked in my anything you know beneath my knees, I don't feel it at all. Um, and again, anything from my elbow to my fingertips, I'm gonna catch maybe about thirty percent of that transmission. Uh, yeah, I I relate to that in a little bit of a different way. There was a time when uh, my mom had, she was doing ironing and the iron was just on the floor and it kept plugged in and I accidentally kicked it and it landed on my foot. And because of my uh, cerebral palsy, it takes it a lot longer to get to from the nerve to the brain. And I had like a, second or second or third degree burn because oh i didn't realize it had happened so yeah i relate to that 100%. oh my god bro. <laughs> that's that's the story that's you know people think like because your body doesn't and again it's like a different type of pain though right with your cp mm -hmm. yeah right? so you may not have felt that burning and you may not have felt your flesh burning um, again, that does not mean that your flesh did not burn up, right? Like you still have <laughs> yeah, to be, to be yeah it definitely burnt. <laughs> yeah, it definitely burned, right? Just took um, it a but, long time to get up there. Right, that's exactly it. And so with that, even though you may not feel, right, some type of external pain like that, there are so many other physical and mental pains um, that come with these conditions. So like things, feelings like pins and needles, and, mm -hmm. you know, just very sharp, very sharp neurotic pains, actually. Um, but, you know, passing it right back over to you. Yeah, um, I'm curious, because I saw you doing a video on Instagram mm -hmm. where you were doing some type of exercise mm -hmm. where you were going back and forth on your legs and you were talking mm -hmm. about it was um, something that people didn't realize. So what kind of uh, therapy or exercise were you doing where you were like balancing uh yeah like when I was on a platform yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah so uh it's this there's this tool called a sand dune stepper um and essentially it's like maybe it's like a three by two foot block um with two platforms on it like actually for you to step on uh I don't even know the material that's in it you know uh it's definitely not sand it's, I, I don't know what type it is. It's not memory foam. It might be like some type of moon foam. You know, I'm just making up a name here. <laughs> but essentially, <laughs> essentially uh, what, it, what it's been helping me with, um, with CMT, we have very, very high arches. Um, so most people can put their entire foot on the ground and that provides a lot of leverage and power for explosive movements. Mm -hmm. um, so me and people, you know, with this disease, usually only the ball of their feet and the heel touch the ground. The arch, the entire middle foot, it has a very high arch. Um, so I've been using this new contraption to try and drop that arch, to try and drop that arch and get more of the center of my foot on the ground. And um, it's pretty good. Like, it's, it's, it's challenging, you know. I think some of the best exercises um, for, for anyone, but especially people dealing with neuropathy, are um, things that throw off your CNS, right? Things that throw off your central nervous system. And so it's just a simple tool that I use. It's a little pricey, it's like $275. Um, I wanted one for like seven or eight years. I always thought it would help me. I wanted one for seven or eight years, but I could just never bring myself to spend the money. And now that I have it, it's like, I low key wasted seven or eight years. By not <laughs> <laughs> so if you have yeah. CMT, and uh, you're able to walk or at least able to stand, I would say it's at least worth, you know, checking out. Um, you know, there's, there's no paid endorsement here. You know, <laughs> I'm just being honest. It's something that has definitely helped me in recent weeks and months. But hey, if you're looking for a sponsor. Yeah, you, you know, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Matt Sandu, dude, I'm plugging you everywhere, so. <laughs> Absolutely, man. So. So one of your passions, obviously, swimming, mm -hmm. and you have a goal to help a million people yes. learn to swim. So how did you, like, how did you start that passion, and how did you end up on Team USA? 100%. Um, so 
So I'm 25. Most people don't know that I was a part. Uh, I'm here in Los Angeles. Most people don't know that I was a part of Los Angeles County, uh, Los Angeles County lifeguards. So I was employed by Los Angeles County lifeguards for I think like seven or eight years. Um, so I had been, you know, I'm well versed. I have, you know, almost over. I'm 25 now since I was 15. I think I, in instruction, I have almost 10 years in the game. You know what I'm saying? Like, if not 10, just right there at the 10 years. So almost a decade in the game of just very formal instruction and teaching people. Um, when I first came to join the Paralympic movement in 2018, um, I said to myself, you know, that obviously I plan on winning a bunch of medals and being the best and being the greatest, and that's all good and dandy. But I wanted to have a way to serve people more than just, you know, them having a picture of me on their wall. Um, and so I just tapped in with, with really my greatest skill and talent, again, which is education um, and, and my love and passion for my career sport, which is swimming. Um, and uh, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm going to teach a million people how to swim. And so that was in 2018. And so with that idea, um, myself and my partner slash coach, business partner slash coach, Wilma Wong, uh, we developed a system that was originally catered toward people who had aquaphobia, which is a fear of water. Um, and we started to work with people who had aquaphobia, people who had survived things like Hurricane Katrina, um, the levees breaking, things like that, these super, super like worst case scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, so we're able to find these people and slowly but surely we're able to get them in the water, get them comfortable, get them swimming. And ultimately that developed into our five hour curriculum, which is the swim uphill method. And uh, you know, pretty much like we're gonna teach a million people how to swim um, right now. You know, COVID has put a little bit of a, not even a little bit of a damper, honestly. Like we're still doing amazing things digitally, um, but we're actually, you know, getting our advisory board together through my foundation, the Swim Uphill Foundation. And I um, mean, it's looking like to hit our mark for 12 years. Let's just say we wanted to teach a million people in 12 years, which is 100% doable. Um, you know, we would be looking at it right around getting 250 people per day to be able to swim. Uh, so we got our work cut out for us, but you know, a big part of it is not just me teaching the world by myself. Um, we developed this curriculum ultimately to be adopted by municipalities and private schools, uh, nationwide and ultimately worldwide. So it's a very real, very attainable goal. And, uh, you know, we're chopping away at it. So it'll be pretty cool because 12 years is, you know, right around like probably going to be the life of my swimming career. Um, so to have those two, you know, huge goals of my young life culminating to a precipice at the same time uh, is really what drives me every day. Yeah, that's awesome, man. And um, first, I'm, I'm curious from the the training aspect for you as a Paralympian, yes, what sir. does what does that look like? And especially now with COVID and everything having an impact, I'm sure you're still training on a regular yeah. schedule. So what does that look like? Um, I would say one thing that my disability neuropathy has allowed me to do is think outside of the box. Um, think outside of the box and not be afraid to say, you know what, that's not right for me in terms of training. Um, so we've been looking, a lot, I've always taken a lot from other sports, like the way that sprint track athletes um, train, the way that fighters, you know, elite fighters of the world train, they can go from, you know, a decent amount of shape, right, just being a pro athlete to, you know, world class, ready to go 12 rounds in a matter of three to four months, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but swimming traditionally is a very, like, grinded out sport you know like people are trying to swim four hours a day and be in the in the weight room two hours a day and uh you know I have a lot of drive and ambition and for a long time I was just committed to doing that um and I didn't always see great results and a lot of times I would actually burn out my central nervous system so I would go from like ascending to this point of being my best and then boom just actually tank so hard um, so now we've learned a lot. I'm a lot more comfortable in my own skin. We've been back at the pool now for about three weeks. I've been back uh, training with weights uh, and plyometrics for about four weeks. And the biggest thing for me is rest and recovery. You know, like mm -hmm. um, 
I'm not I'm not interested in impressing anyone with my workout schedule and routine. Um, I don't think it's right for everyone, but dude, I miss I miss days of swim practice every week. You know, I could easily miss two to three days of swim practice every week. Um, again, I swim a short race, so that does give me a little bit of lead way. But ultimately, just because, you know, if, if I'm worn down and I'm not well rested, then I'm only really digging myself in a deeper hole anyway. So I think that is probably the biggest, you know, thing that really my disability has allowed me to become comfortable with is taking the time and rest like this morning. I had practice. I had weightlifting last night and we have practice that's from 6 to 8 a.m. this morning. Um, and I just didn't make it. You know, and my me and my coach, you know, we've been together for three years now, so we understand each other. Um, so it's no longer a thing of like, Jamal, you got to get here, like you, you, you're you slack and anything like that. It's like we understand that I, I really have to listen to my body, you know, and I think that goes for any athlete or any person. Listen to your body, listen to your gut, listen to your heart, um, you know, because at the end of the day, if you're wrong, it's good because at least, you know, it's like that responsibility falls on you, which I think is like a much better feeling and a peaceful scenario than, you know, really trying to push yourself to fit someone else's model of what they think is right or the way it has to be done. You know, and if I may just this last little bit, because I'm sure some athletes will catch this, you know, we always talk about basketball is an easy one. We always talk about Michael Jordan being the greatest and Kobe Bryant being the greatest and like the mama mentality of like, you know, I'm up at 5 a.m. From 5 to 8, I'm in the gym. Take a lunch break. From 10 to 1.30, I'm in the gym. Take a snack break. And then from 5 to 9 o'clock at night, I'm in the gym. And that's great for Kobe Bryant. I love him so much, you know. He's won how many championships, how many this, how many that. Um, but then I ask people, you know, obviously we love these people because of their personalities, right? That's kind of what has ascended them to this level of greatness. But you got to understand, there are people like Tim Duncan, in the NBA who have more championships than Kobe, who have just as many MVPs, who have just as many accolades on paper, but a completely different style and method for attaining all those things that he attained. Um, so there's never just one way to skin a cat. You don't have to be neurotic and crazy. Um, you can do what's right for you and, you know, have confidence in that. <laughs> That's such a good, like, picture of the, the big fundamental man and yeah, the and, big fundamental. Yeah, yeah. He uh, he was never the loudest, never the yep. most in your face. But like you said, he he did it his way, and um, he's one of the greatest for sure. One of the greatest, easily yeah. one of the greatest. Whether whether or not people just automatically name him because he's so quiet, it's easy, right, to forget. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. or to just overlook. But uh, you know, again. Stats, numbers, they don't lie. This definitely was not somebody who was riding someone's coattails to those championships. Um, he was riding the mix, carrying those teams, uh, just like any of the greats. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of people are going to gain a lot of what you just said because like, it doesn't matter if you have disability or not. Mm -hmm. um, you can apply that. Um, go at your own pace, figure out your own body. And, and you mentioned something about being comfortable in your own skin. Yes, sir. What do you think, like, made the shift from when you you weren't to where you are now? Um, I think the biggest shift was, uh, so there was two. I would say there was, like, a pre-shift and, uh, and a primary shift. So the pre-shift was, you know, when my current coach Wilma first kind of addressed that she thought something was wrong. Um, you know, mind you, I've had coaches my entire life, and it wasn't until I have this coach when I'm 23 years old after I've dropped out of college and I'm trying to make the Olympic team um, to come to me and say, hey, like, I see the way that you get out of cars. I see the way that you jump. I see the way that you swim, the way that you move. You remind, you remind me of some of my cerebral palsy patients, actually. Um, you know, she was a healer by nature. So she had seen a lot of individuals with neuropathy. Um, so she's like, you remind me of this. And at that time, I'm like, oh, that's crazy, you know, because prior to this, I never wanted to be the guy with excuses. Like I said, it was a blessing that I was able to hide behind like my visual appearance. But it was also a curse, right? Because like, I'm able to hide behind my visual experience. So it's like, I don't want to be the guy telling people, 
I know you can't see this, but I'm actually dealing with something pretty major over here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, she said that to me. And, you know, from that, she was like, hey, you know, maybe instead of the Olympics, we should try and go for the Paralympics. Um, and that was a big point for me because up until that time, you know, if someone had asked me were – uh, fully able-bodied and, you know, I'm not PC, but like disabled body athletes created equally, I would have said 100% they are. But once I myself was in that position, I was personally offended. Um, it was no longer equal, right? Like, no, the Paralympics is not the Olympics, coach. Like, don't ever say anything disrespectful like that to me again, really. Like, in so many words is what I said to her. Um, so she left it alone. A few months later, another friend from England came out to visit us. Uh, we were swimming against each other. We were looking over the video and he sees me dive in and he says, man, did you know your legs don't work? Um, Cause it's very, it's very clear, right? You're Especially like, yes, like, but I don't want anybody else to know. <laughs> right. Exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah. But I don't want anyone else to know. And in an instant, he's like, dude, you should go do the Paralympics. Um, and so, you know, with reluctance, I'm like, okay, she said it, here goes this guy who, you know, he's my friend, but you know, he doesn't really know anything about me. He's saying it with absolutely no ulterior motive. Like, maybe this is something I just need to check out. You know what I'm saying? So I was 2018, I ended up joining the Paralympics. I ended up winning my first national title that year. But right before that national championship, I had a really, really, not a big breakdown, but a big breakthrough um, where I just, you know, had to, take the man in the mirror and I, and I came to my father and I was in tears. I was broken up because it's like for the past 13 years of my life, I've been living, you know, obviously I know there's something going on, but for the most part, I've been living in denial and shame. Like I don't want there to be anything wrong with me. I don't want people to look at me different. I don't want <laughs> all of my friends, girlfriends, cousins, uncles to feel like I've just lied to them for, the, for, for most of my life. Um, I'm already a black man in a predominantly white sport, like swimming, very few people of color. So like, I already feel like mm -hmm. eyes are on me at all times. You know what I'm saying? The last thing I want is even more eyes on me now um, with people trying to figure out what's going on. Um, I don't want to, I don't ever want to be called a cheater or, you know, seen as, you know, someone who shouldn't even be in the Paralympics just because of, again, because of what it appears to be. Um, and, you know, that, that, was, that was a big breakthrough for me. And I came out of that ultimately having made the decision to own my truth and, uh, and to live in that every day. And uh, ever since I've done that, you know, we've been able to inspire a lot of people. A lot of the fears that I was scared were going to happen were really just their fears that haven't reared their heads or if they have, it's been in a very mild way. And ultimately, even if they were, you know, these big hairy monsters that stood in my path, you know, I would, uh, I would knock them over and keep it pushing um, because we're on a mission. Absolutely. Um, so just to give people a little bit more on where you are in the journey with the, Paralympic. So you are number what in the world as a swimmer? Okay. <laughs> I'm number seven in the world right now. Number seven in the world for my primary event, the 50 meter freestyle. I'm number one in the nation for the 50 meter freestyle and the 100 meter freestyle. And, um, you know, I'm like pretty high ranked for a couple other strokes, but yeah, number seven in the whole world. So that is a uh, that's no small feat, but you know me, there's, there's still a good amount of distance between number seven and number one. Um, just like, you know, same thing with teaching a million. We still got a lot of work to do. So every day, every but day. Is its own. Here's why that's important to, to, to me. Uh, so that's important because that happened once that shame started to be let go mm -hmm. and you shifted lanes into something where you're like all those things you just talked about where they were the fears or the judgments that you were putting on yourself once you took the leap and you went over there you you turned into number seven in the world with all the work that you did yes sir that's accurate so anybody watching if you're sitting 
uh, feeling similar feelings about your own disability or maybe a family member's disability, uh, once there comes a chance for that acceptance, you never know what's possible on the other end of that. Well said, bro. I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, is there anything before we end the interview that you want to leave the audience with? <clears throat> um, really, the what I would say is just, you know, we're all we're all these spiritual beings having a human experience. Um, there are certain things about your person that you'll never be able to change. Um, certain things about your past, you definitely will never be able to change, right? Uh, there's so much out of your control. Um, but, you know, it, it's a bit cliche, man, but we only got this one life, you know, as far as I know, as far as I can, I don't remember where I was before I got into this body. And I probably won't remember where I am next, you know, from this life. So we only got this one life. We got this one opportunity. And I mean, <laughs> we're already born naked, you know, so you might as well just let that heart light shine. Like, let that heart shine. If you're facing your fears, if they seem too big, or if they seem too daunting, you know, I heard somebody say something once, like, if you got this big, crazy dream that you think might take you 10 years to accomplish, right, which is literally what I'm talking to you all about here, might take you 10 years to accomplish, and it seems like too long and too big and too whatever, you know, somebody said to me, guess what? In 10 years, you're still going to be 10 years older. The only difference is you will either done it or you haven't. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So you're going to get older every day, God willing, until the day that, you know, we return. But um, just go for it, man. Like, I dropped out, you know, and again, this is my personal journey. I tell people all the time, like, you got to do you. Um, but, dude, I, I dropped out of college as a junior in college to go become a professional swimmer um, when – it really did not look good. Like on paper, you know, you would have thought I was crazy. A lot of people thought I was crazy. Thank God I have, you know, amazing parents. They believed in me. They they know the stamina of my character. Like I think they just had something in them, the same thing that was in me that let them believe. But I say that to say, like, sometimes you got to take a risk. You got to take a chance. Um, you know, my, my, my mindset at that time was this is my dream. I see a very limited window of opportunity to accomplish this. So, you know what? I can't continue to spend my life here right now. I got to go after this because this is going to bring me fulfillment. I can't live for you right now. I got to live for me because, you know, well, what if we're both wrong? What if what you want me to do and what I want to do is both wrong? <laughs> no. <laughs> and, and it's real. It's real. Mm -hmm. It's very real. So I'm saying, you know, to say that I've taken a lot of chances and done a lot of things over the course of, you know, really, I guess the past five years that have gone terrible that have not worked at all. Um, but there are things that have just worked so great and have been so divine time that I'm in a position to have conversations like this with you today, Nathan, and hopefully um, reach the people who need to hear it. So just believe in yourself, um, you know, and however big or scary or new it seems, if you want it, I'm here to tell you, go after it, man. Go after it, go after it, go after it. The worst thing that'll happen is You'll be better and you'll be closer to it than you are today right now. That's the worst thing that can happen. You'll be better at it and you'll be closer to it than you are right now. Yeah, absolutely. You're moving forward. Even if you don't hit it, you're closer than you were before. So, Jamal, with that, where can people, if they want to join you on your mission to serve a million people, where can they go to support the mission? You can go to www.swimuphill.com. Um, you can go to Instagram at swimuphill, Twitter, Facebook at swimuphill, LinkedIn, Jamal Hill, Jamal Hill on LinkedIn. Um, so if you search Jamal Hill Swimming or Swim Uphill, you will find it. You will find any resources that you need to connect with me or my team further or, uh, you know, to support our foundation's mission of teaching a million people how to swim, or just, you know, to see some cool stuff, see some cool exercises. Um, that's it. Swim Uphill, Jamal Hill Swimmer, and uh, there you go. 
All right, man. Thanks so much for taking the time this morning to join us. I can't wait for people to see this. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nathan.